So Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, starts out God. I think the Holy Spirit is saying he's the author. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, sundry times and divers manners, that's kind of like saying many different time periods and, and in many different ways God spoke or spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He hath in these days, or these last days, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, I don't know if you picked up on what we just said, but there, that's a whole mouthful right there of revelation, because you got to realize, you might have heard some of this in the church. These guys never heard this before. And so this apostle who's saying this, who I believe is Paul, he says that in these days he didn't speak by the prophets. He spoke, God spoke by his son, and he has taken his son and appointed him to be heir of all things. What's all things? How much is all? Everything. Everything. In other words, he's taken everything and placed it under Christ. Christ is the heir, Amen. right? There's only one Christ. There's only one only begotten Son. There's only one Savior. Yeah. You can't, and you can't even say, "Well, I, I, I believe in God, but I call Him by the name of Allah." I'll tell you what: when you say Allah, Jesus does not answer. If someone's answering that prayer, it's not God. What if you? What if it's Buddha? What if, what if someone worships Buddha and someone, Buddha is answering their prayer? And they say, I believe in God. God answers my prayer. It's not God. Satan is quite able to answer your prayers. And why would he do that? Why would he treat you nice? Why would he bless you? He's, tra- you know, it, it's kind of like tricking you. It's kind of like when you're fishing and you, you, you got that, uh, what do you call it, a little lure. And so, you, you know, you cast it out and then you're, you know, you're waiting. It's, it's, uh, the fish comes and gets it and you just reel them in, right? That's what Satan's trying to do here. When, when anyone's going after any type of religion that's not this religion, and that sounds kind of arrogant, but unfortunately, God can be arrogant because he's God. You know, he's not one of them. He's the only one. And he made it all. And Jesus can be arrogant because Jesus is Lord. In these last days, and, and even we did a lot of study before on the last days, right? Well, when is the last days? Well, they obviously began right here. Because he says, in these last days, he spoke to us by his son. So this whole period of the last days begins with the arrival of Jesus, right? That's what it's saying. He's appointed him heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Now, I've talked to uh, Muslims, and they said, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus is God. Well, did you know that I think it's a half a dozen different scriptures and a half a dozen different books in the New Testament that says that Jesus is a creator. Amen. Now, if Jesus is the creator, it sounds kind of likely that he's God, right? I mean, if you got another, you got somebody else that's the creator and you're calling someone else God, I think you're making a mistake. You're supposed to be worshiping the Creator, right? So here we have the revelation that Jesus is the Creator and the heir of all things. Verse 3, who being the brightness, Jesus, who, who is Jesus? Jesus, who being the brightness of His glory... And the express image of his person. Who's he talking about? He's talking about God. 
God's Spirit, right? The Spirit of God. He's saying that Jesus is being, he's in the, is the brightness of God's glory, right? And he's the express image of God's person. In other words, Jesus is the image of God. And his job, one of his main jobs was to reveal the Father. And I'm, I, I'm proud to say that he accomplished what he came to do because he revealed it to me. Now, I wasn't even there back then. But I know Jesus is God, and I know he's the creator. So I think he accomplished his, his, uh, what he set out to do. But he's the brightness of God's glory, the express image of God's person. I always used to wonder, you know, you, you got the Ten Commandments. Does anybody know what the second commandment was? You said idols, but you, you, you started it. She's finishing. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Right, exactly. Thou shalt, and thou shalt not make any graven image, right? In other words, God forbids you to have an image of Him and worship that image. Now, Jesus is the image. Him you can worship. We don't know what He looks like. I mean, people make pictures and they worship pictures and that's what He says. Yes, I don't. Oh, there is no difference in the image. There's no difference in my mind than uh, the Old Testament, the graven images, and what they have in the Catholic churches. Yeah. Well, all these saints, and uh, you know, you can even buy those little statues and bring them home, and then you can have these little gods at home. But he comes right here and says, Jesus is the express image of His person. Do you want to know what God looks like? He looks like Jesus. Jesus told the apostles when he was there, he says, have I been here all this time and you still don't know who I am? Because they said, show us the Father. He said, have I been here all this time? You still don't know? How could you miss it? I did all this stuff. Whoever did all the miracles Jesus did. You know, the Bible's loaded with miracles, but not like Jesus did. Right. Jesus did more miracles than anybody else. So, I mean, the de- and, and you know what Jesus went through is just to show us what Satan will put you through. Yeah. Jesus went through temptation. And the, the difference of Jesus is no matter how many times the devil tried to hit him, he never got through. Jesus was able to block everyone. Right? Do you ever hear that song, The Champion? Yeah. Where it, that's what it is. It's G, Jesus against the devil, and they're boxing. And then all of a sudden, it says, and then prophetically, his hands went down. And then Satan, boom, KO'd him. And then, but then he ro- raises, rises from the dead. But anyway, if you haven't heard that, that was Carmen years ago, a song called The Champion. But uh, we're, we're uh, digressing here. Anyway, so he, Jesus is the brightness of his glory, So if you want to know the glory, you see it in the face of Jesus. One of the problems we have is we haven't seen Jesus. We've been asked to believe in Jesus by faith alone. That's right. Blessed are those who see and still believe. That's right. So you, if you believe you have a lot more going for you than the people that needed to see him and touch him. Yeah. You know, Thomas said, I won't believe unless I touch him. Unless I put my, put my fingers in his holes where they, where they crucified him. But we're asked to believe strictly because God said it. And I hope that you have the attitude that I have. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Notice this. He's the brightness of his glory, the express image of his spirit, and upholding all things by the word of his power. 
the whole creation came forth by words. God spoke words. Everything you see, now I, I realize, and I'm not real scientific, so I can't go too far on this, but I hope you realize from school that we are made up of atoms. And really, if I said, everything's made up of atoms, right? If I said this pulpit is solid, and Joanna says, there's nothing there, she would be more accurate than me. Even though all of us would say it's there. We can feel it. We can touch it, right? But what's happening is you have, you have a, the proton and the neutrons in the nucleus, and then you've got all these electrons going around, right? If the nucleus of an atom was the size of a basketball, the electron path would be 300,000 miles away from the nucleus. That's amazing. But look at all that space. There's more, there's all space here. But you don't see the space. Because your eyes are set to pick that up. God made those eyes so, so you will see what you... And, and he made us all in this three-dimensional world, what appears to be a three-dimensional world. And when we touch it, I have these molecules, these uh, electrons speeding around and around and around, all these, all these nucleuses, right? All these atoms. And so does this. And what happens is when I put my hand on it, this is competing with that. And the electrons that belong to my hand, they know they belong here. And the ones that belong to this wood, they know they belong there. And that's why I can't put my hand through. We're so set on our own perception of reality. And I guess what, what I'm asking you to do up front here is to realize as we go through this that things aren't really the way you see them. You know, you hear what you hear because your ears are tuned to hear. And anyone that's getting older... Your hearing starts getting out, going out, right? I mean, it gets de it gets decreasing, especially for a male, female voices. Now, my wife says I just don't listen to her, but that's not really true. <laughs> that's what I say about my husband. He don't listen to me. No, and but but there's there's a there's a physical reason. There's a physical. I guess I'm not saying anything interesting. I don't know. <laughs> What is the point? So he's upholding all things by the word of his power. If anything, God has revealed, you can go back to Genesis, when he spoke the word, look at the power that came out. In fact, science, they used to believe that the earth was inf infinite. Or not the earth, but the, the universe was infinite. They don't believe that anymore. They believe it's finite. And finite means there's an end to it. And they also believe, now I'm not saying that they're right, but the theory is that in the beginning there was this great big bang. And then everything moved out from that explosion. Now, of course, they'll tell you that nothing existed in the beginning and then it exploded. If there was a firecracker, I understand a firecracker existed and then it exploded. But don't tell me nothing existed and then it exploded. Something must have existed. And who made the something? Even if it's true about the Big Bang, who made that something? God. God. It had, you, when you get down to it, you had to have had a creator. But the thing Hebrew picks up on, he said that God upholds all things... And he was talking before about, in, in the previous verse, he was talking about being appointed, Jesus being appointed heir of all things by whom he also made the worlds. He's talking about creation, right? And then he talks about, he's upholding all these things by the word. He's upholding all things by the word of his power when he had 
by himself purge our sins. So the book of Romans is all about talking about you know you, salvation and how you, Jesus is is the sacrifice, right? And that you're uh, you've been purged of your sins. But here, right from the get go, it tells you that Jesus Himself purged our sins. Now, how many have heard of purgatory? They used to teach me that because I was raised Catholic. Okay, hell is not purgatory. There is a hell. Purgatory was invented by the Catholic Church, and it's a doctrine that they have this make-believe place that when Christians die on the earth, they go to purgatory. They all go to purgatory because they have to be there until they are purged of their sins. Jesus himself purged our sins. So there is no other purging. No. How many, how many are glad that when you die, you don't have to worry about purgatory? Because I heard that place, the make-believe place, is not a very good place to go. It's like hell. And you're burning. And of course, if you're, a, if, you, if you're obedient Catholic and you wear the scapular, you've heard me say that, right? Yes. Mary will come every Saturday, descend into purgatory, and take you off because you wore the scapular. That is the weirdest thing. But why did they do it? Because people wanted to buy them. That's how they make money. They sell stuff. I mean, you could go to Catholic stores and you see all this merchandise. But, you know, it, we're not far removed. You go to a, a regular Christian store and you got all this stuff too. Just because it's in a Christian store does not mean it's good for you. Right. Exactly. I mean, in a Christian store, they could have these little statues. Right? He upholds all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now we know this is true because Stephen, the first martyr, he had heaven looked uh, opened up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And here it says he sat down at the right hand of God, right? Or the majesty on high. So think about this. If Jesus was there and he was sitting down, and when, when Stephen was being stoned, he saw him standing up. In other words, what happened, the way I see it is, Jesus was sitting there, and when Stephen was about to be martyred, he was attentive. He knew exactly what was going on. And the reason I want to bring this up is because when you're going through stuff, if you are one of God's children, Jesus knows everything you're going through. And when you go through the rough time and you say, Lord, God, help me. I'm not saying the heavens are going to be open and you're going to see it, but I believe he stands up. He's going to make sure when you've, when you've given him the task, because he says pray, right? Believe that you, you receive it and you shall have it. He didn't ask us to, to ask and believe if he wasn't going to do it, right? And once that transaction gets his attention, which we call prayer, Jesus is on it. And he's already dispatched help. And he does that in the form of angels many times. You don't you would you you and I don't have any and when I say you, I'm including I should say us, but let's just make that a rule. When you hear me say you, I'm talking about me too. I'm not trying I, I am no better off than you. I I mean I, I am in this just like you are. It's us. We, we have no idea how much angels are in, in, uh, involved in our lives. I know for sure one time I was, I was going down a street and uh, 
in the winter and I lost control. And I stopped right in front of a tree that much. I didn't even injure my car. I just stopped. I mean, I was sliding all over because I was going down a hill. It was icy. I was going on. And then I stopped right in front of the tree. I could have been dead. And I believe, I didn't see it, but I believe an angel stopped it. I mean, if a tree, if it would have hit the tree, I would say the tree stopped it. But it didn't. It stopped right in front of the tree. I mean, you could go through, everybody has had experiences, right? So we're in verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, who? Who was made better than the angels? Us. No, not uh, Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, right? So being made so much better than the angels, because we just got through talking about angels involved in our lives, right? So being made, he's so much better than the angels, and he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What is the name he inherited? Yeshua. Yeshua. Well, tell me what that is in English. Jesus. We say Jesus. Hebrew, Yeshua. Uh, Jesus. Yeah, from, uh, well, Spanish or um, it's Greek too. So anyway, uh, so he has, he's much better than the angels and he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, I believe the name is Yeshua or Jesus because he says elsewhere, he says um, that he's uh, given him a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. And there's no higher name. Because he said in Ephesians, he said, he's given him a name above all names. So if Jesus inherited a name, it must be the name above all names. It just so happens that when he was on the earth, he, his parents named him Jesus. The name means salvation of Jehovah. But when he received his inheritance, after his resurrection, after he conquered death on your behalf, and he was given his inheritance, he was also given the name above every name. At the time that when he was on the earth and uh, before the, the, the uh, resurrection, he didn't have the name above every name. He got that during the conquest. He beat Satan. Satan thought he beat Jesus. Can you imagine Satan thinking Jesus is hanging on the cross? And I can imagine in hell, they're having a party. Amen. Because Satan tried to get him. We talked about the temptation. Of God. He tried and tried and tried. And we know, it, even though it's not everything is recorded, but we know he came back and continued to try because he said Satan went to leave him for a better time. So you know he came back. He tried, he tried to stone him. He tried to you know, kill him in various different ways. Tried to trip him up. He couldn't touch him. And then all of a sudden Jesus is on the cross dying. And then it goes dark. Three hours of darkness. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the devil's scratching his head. The point here in verse 4 is that Jesus is better and higher than the angels, all angels. And that he's inherited a more excellent name than they. Now, since we're on this subject, who's the greatest angel? Uh, Michael. Michael. Yeah, Michael. Michael. Michael is the greatest. Michael's the one that Gabriel calls for help. Yeah. Right? If you've got a choice. Well, we're not supposed to call out the angels, right? But I see Daniel. Gabriel came to Daniel, and Michael came to help, and 
And I think if, if God treated Daniel like that, why wouldn't he send angels to me? Because Daniel was not a member of the church. Daniel wasn't born again. No, he was faithful. He was a prophet. He had the Holy Spirit working in him a lot. But he wasn't sealed like we're sealed in the, in the New Testament as a, a child of God. A child of God is greater than any other person out there on the earth that's not a child of God. We are, we are not only greater than the other people, we're greater than the angels in the resurrection as the children of God. Do you understand? We're going to have the, these bodies. That's not going to be what we're living in eternity. We're going to get glorified bodies. And we're going to be radiating His glory. And that's tremendous. So verse 5 says, For unto which of the angels... Now he's trying to... What he's doing here, he's comparing... He's, in fact, what you're going to find in Hebrews is he's going to compare Jesus against the angels. He's going to compare Jesus with Moses. He's going to compare Jesus with Aaron. And the idea is to show you that neither the angels nor Aaron nor Moses means anything. Compared to Christ. And that, he said he, at sundry times and in very diverse ways, and he preached through, he spoke through prophets. But in his last days, he spoke through his son. That makes a whole different story when you got God's son speaking at you. So for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. So what this is saying is, which angel did, did God say that thou art my son? The only one he ever said that to was Jesus. Yeah. Right? So right there, none of the, even though we in the Old Testament talks about the angels being sons of God, not like Jesus. And we know that for a fact because Jesus was called the only begotten son of God. And if the angels were all sons of God equal to Jesus, then that wouldn't, ma that, that wouldn't fit, would it? Just like we are called the children of God. We are sons and we are daughters of God. But we're not God. There are people out there that are preaching that. They're preaching that you can be a God. You know where I heard that lie? The Garden of Eden. Satan said... You will be like gods if you, if you eat the forbidden fruit. And so what these preachers today, some of them are saying, you can be like God. All you got to do is eat the forbidden fruit. Well, Where did you hear that before? You got to be careful today. This is what you're supposed to make your decision on. The word of God. Very unfortunate that so few people in the members of the church open up the Bible so few some say well it's too you know it's too complicated I can't understand it it's pastor's job well pastor or the elders or my Bible. <laughs> it's everybody's job yeah. for them you know? and no I, and I agree with you yeah, yeah. your job is the shepherd but everyone is supposed to study I think we're supposed to get from the scripture that Michael, being called Archangel, what that really means is general of the angels. And that's why there's only one. Now, some churches teach there's seven archangels. Some say there's three. Uh, Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael. Have you ever heard of Raphael? Yeah. Yeah. But that comes out of some of the Catholic uh, apocryphal books where Raphael was, a, uh, it, it was an angel. A Mexican angel. A Mexican angel. Hey, maybe he was a Mexican angel. But really, the Bible only talks about one archangel. But then it talks, you know, when, when you, if you can remember from Revelation where we had, we went into the throne room and around God's throne were with these four living creatures. 
Remember, one had a face like an ox. One was like a man. One was like an eagle. What was the other one? A man. Yeah. And so yet they had... In, in Ezekiel, they appear also. And he, they, they're always around God's throne. When, in, in, here in Ezekiel, God's sitting in his throne. He's like, God has his own chariot. And he's like going through the heavens, and he's in his throne, you know, in his chariot. And these cherubim are on the sides. And, and then we find out that they not only had one face, they had four faces. And they never turned. If they wanted, if, if God said, okay, I want to go this way (laughs) they would just go like this because they had a face looking like this and if God said I want to go this way they already had a face looking this way but one was looking this way one was looking this way right Uh those are called cherubim in the uh, garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were cast out he put a cherub uh, two cherubim there to prevent them from coming back into the garden and it says that Satan used to be a cherub. See, some people say, well, I think Satan used to be an archangel. No, Satan was an archangel. Satan was a cherub, according to the book of Ezekiel. In fact, it talks about Satan being the, the cherub and being in the Garden of Eden, in Ezekiel. So you have to put it, you know, you have to... Put it all together. He was never an angel. He was an angel. Yeah, there he was. Oh, who, who, Lucifer? Lucifer. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A cherub, a cherub is a kind of angel. Right. Angel is a more broader category. Yeah. Now he doesn't give us. Now there's also called seraphim. Seraphim. Isaiah saw seraphim around the the throne, and it seems like all they do, they have uh, uh, three sets, three pairs of wings. And they cover their feet and they cover their bodies and then they're flying with the other ones. And they just continually say, holy, holy, holy. They're continually praising God. And so I mean, we're, we're to learn right there. Praise is a good thing, right? Now what the Bible does talk about for this hierarchy, he does talk about the hierarchy of the enemy. Of course, you've got Satan. But he calls it principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spirits of wickedness in heavenly places. Those are different categories. And that doesn't even include the demons. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. When did he begot thee? Because when Jesus came to the earth, he was the only begotten son. And what's interesting is he's not called the only begotten. You'll see he's called the first begotten from the dead. The first begotten from the dead. If I say, this is, I'm introducing, this is my first child. What does that tell you? There's more. There's probably more. And they're the first born. Right? This is my first child. Or these are, this is my first and second child. That doesn't really tell you. You could only have two. But if I say this is my first, I wouldn't say first. If there, you know, I would just say this is my child. Or only child. Or only child. But if I say first... That's part of the revelation we're going to see in Hebrews. Because Jesus is called the first begotten from the dead. And if there's a first, there's a second. And a third. And a fourth. But don't think you're equivalent and equal. Jesus inherits everything. Jesus is the top dog. Right, right. You get saved, I'm telling you, and I'm telling me. You get saved because of his works. You don't get a reward because of his works. You get a reward based upon what you do. And that's where you're coming saying you need to repent, right? You, you, you'll be judged. You think, well, I thought if we're Christian, we won't be judged. Well, we're not going to be judged heaven or hell. 
right? We're not going to be, he's not going to take us and cast us into hell because we're Christians. But we could be up there in heaven and not get any inheritance at all. Now, how is that going to make you feel when you're, we're all up there? In fact, God may just have us all in the same room. It may be, that, let's just, just take this idea, because there's only a few people here, right? Let's say, just for sake of argument, let's say that the only ones that are going in the, in the rapture are these few people. <laughs> right? We're the only ones. We all may. Let's just say that. Aren't you glad you're up there? But you're going to also be judged for your works. Oh, yeah. Because Jesus didn't just save you. He didn't just save you for you to sit on that chair. He saved you for you to do something for his kingdom. And we went over the warnings in our last study with the mysteries. How that one guy said, I took your talent and I hid it in the ground. He hid it. Now, God said, thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Now, we know that Jesus was the only begotten from eternity. But here's something that changed. This day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be. Isn't that future? I will be. Not I am. But I will be to him a father. Didn't, when Jesus was on the earth, didn't he call God his father? Now God says, this day I have begotten you. I give you the inheritance. And I will be a father to you and you will be a son to me. God can do everything, right? Anything. Amen. There's nothing that God can't do. But the one thing that God couldn't do that had to be done to save mankind, God can't die. Right? That's why Jesus, from the beginning, the plan was Jesus was going to come into the world and give his life for mankind. Why? Why did he do it? I believe he did it for the Father. The Father said, you know, they used to talk to each other. You know, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they'd walk down the street together, and Right? They probably hung out, shot pool. So when Jesus rises from the dead, he's now the first begotten. And look at the very next verse. Mm -hmm. It says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world. That was the only begotten son that that went into Mary's womb. Right? Right? And then, she, then he was born. He was still the only begotten son. But this is when he, he brings forth the first begotten into the world. He said, let all the angels of God worship him. Now, what was the first commandment? To worship all God before Exactly. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of... <clears throat> Right? You shall have no other gods that you worship. Or he actually says before me. But God, God was against anyone receiving worship. That was, that, most people that have studied the Bible, that believe the Bible, believe that Satan's sin was that he was leading people to worship him. Does that kind of sound like him? So why would God, God is God, and he said, don't worship anybody except for me. And then he said, let all the angels of God worship him. Because he's fully God also, right? Now these Muslims that tell you that nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus is God. This is right here. And of the angels, he said, now remember them angels we were talking about? The angels who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. In other words, angels are fiery beings. 
They're made out of a completely different substance than we are. And yet, they can take bodies. They can take the form of bodies. And, and some of them, uh, we spoke about this in Genesis, they actually produce children with, with women. Angels. They, they disobeyed. They took upon their bodies. They had sex with women. And they produced giants. Angels can, you see them throughout the scripture. You can see angels come and they're in a body. But the body dematerializes and they go back to their fiery self. Their fiery, that doesn't mean they don't have bodies. Do you remember the scripture where uh, Israel was surrounded by the Assyrians, I think it was the Assyrians. And uh, Elijah or Elisha, I think it was Elisha, said to, or his servant said, what are we going to do? We're surrounded. And he says, Lord, open up his eyes. And when he did, he saw armies of God, and they were fire. Horses, cavalry, a fire. You read in the Revelation about these weird creatures, and you think, oh, that, maybe that's a symbol. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe that's exactly what they look like. Yeah, that's what they saw. Of the angels, he said, who makes his angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the sun, he says, watch this. Of the sun, God says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. Doesn't it tell us that the Son of God is God? Doesn't it just, didn't he just say again that he is the creator, that he laid the foundation, that he, in, in, in uh, inheritance, by inheritance, he inherited everything, all things are under him? Amen. He's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He said, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old, as doth a garment. Wax old is um, like grow old. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. Isn't that interesting? He's saying about the heavens... He said about the heavens, uh, heavens are the works of thy hand, but they shall perish. In other words, these heavens that were created are going to cease to exist, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt fold them up. What do you do? You, you, you do your laundry and fold up your clothes and you stick them in the drawer, right? He's folding it up. He folds it up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. How, how are they going to change? Because God will make all things new. Remember that? But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thy enemy thy footstool? No angel. Only Christ. This last verse, and then, and then we're going to quit for tonight. This last verse is powerful also. It ta- it's talking about the angels. Remember, the whole, the, one, of the whole purposes, one of the purposes in this ch- first chapter is to compare Jesus with the angels, right? And this last verse says about the angels. He, said, he asks the question, are they not all ministering spirits? God says about his angels, aren't, aren't all of the angels that I have, aren't all of them ministering spirits sent forth to minister? Isn't that their job? It's the same thing. We have a job to do. Now, what would you think 
of the angel that... I mean, and I'm glad. I'm glad God is strict. And I'm telling you what, God is very strict. But let's say, what if uh, God says to, uh, you know, maybe the angel Harry. I don't know if there's an angel Harry. But he says to Harry, he said, Harry, I've appointed you to watch over my child, Ron. And so I'm dependent upon Harry. Watching out over me, right? My guardian angel. And Harry says, well, I ain't going to do what God said. <laughs> you know, pastor's got a, pastor has an angel. John has an angel. We all have angels. And I got Harry. And I don't mean I grew Harry. I got Harry the angel. And Harry the angel won't do what, his, what he's supposed to do. It's the same thing if you think about it. When we as Christians don't do what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to find out what it is God's called us to do and then do it. And then when you get to heaven, you'll have at least, at least you'll get a reward for what you did. Now that doesn't, <laughs> just because you did that don't mean you, you, you know, now you can do anything you want. And you still got to live a good life, Right. He says, aren't they all, or are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? All of them are ministering spirits. All of the angels. How many angels are there? Myriads and myriads. Now, don't ask me what a myriad is. But I think you said it. It's a lot. It's a lot. And by the way... Satan does have angels, but God has twice as many. So he's already got them beat twice, right? And then he's God. You can't beat God. So God's going to win. But the key here, what I want you to see is, aren't they all ministering spirits sent forth? So in other words, when we are praying to God for help? He already dispatched the angels. They're already been sent forth. When you walk through when you walk through life, when I walk through we need to remember angels are around us. Amen. We are not like everybody else. You think David went after Goliath, and he did. You ought to be going after the devil like that. Now, I'm not saying to spend your time chasing, you know, chasing demons or something. I'm just saying, don't be afraid. It is written. It is written. As long as you stay on it is written, you're going to win. I don't care what you're going through in life. I don't know what God's called you to do. I know what God's called me to do, but I'm sure I don't know everything God's called me to do. But one thing I can tell you for sure is you will win if you keep doing what the Word says. You will win. They're sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. In other words, He just said all of His angels have the task, are committed to the task of being sent forth to minister to us who are the children of God. That's their job. And their job in the future will probably be the same thing, to minister to us. They're going to be working for us. 